I got this as a present. The hidden messages in water. And on the support group, I saw a notice from, uh, from Sean, who made a, a, a reference, not to this book, but the predecessors of this book. Uh, Sean put a link also there. The author is Japanese, Masaru Emoto. The previous books were called The Messages, The Message in Water, part one, part two, part three, I don't know how far it goes, but anyway. <coughs> then this book came, Hidden Messages in Water. It is absolutely marvelous. What is it about? It is about how incredibly sensitive water is to to anything, to vibration, to uh, emotion. And this man is a scientist. He is not a, a, a gold blue and uh, sock bearer. Uh, new, age, uh, new age kind of, uh, with his hand in the clouds uh, kind of uh, guy. He's a real scientist, uh, but obviously very intuitive. And he started to explore the behavior of water, and then this book in particular, is about ice crystals. And as you know, ice crystals can be very beautiful. And so he started to expose freezing water to various kinds of things. Emotions, talking, even written messages, and music also. And he started phot photographing those ice crystals, and it is just incredible what he discovered. Um, using the words of love and compassion and uh, nice messages, the ice crystals become very beautiful. But if you use negative emotions, Ice crystals don't even develop in a, in a, in a shape or anything. It, it just becomes frozen without any uh, shape. Is it apt? There are so many pictures also that show the differences. Uh, he, he exposed uh, freezing water to uh, uh, music from Bach, Mozart, and very beautiful ice crystals. Then he exposed the music to hard rock, and the ice crystals were totally chaotic no shape and nothing, not nice at all, very ragged and, and uh, disharmonious. Um, it's just incredible. And it touches so much upon what we do. And it confirms also, because you exist for 80% out of water, or 70 or 80% out of water, you are the same as what happens with this, this, these ice crystals. And if you pay attention, you feel that also. when. Um, uh, he made a comparison with uh, giving an order to somebody. When you, when you demand something, you can do that in two ways. You can do that in a way that the person has a feeling that he must do something, forced to do something, and the ice crystals become, again, ragged. While if you, if you, if you wrap the order into a suggestion, Ice crystal again developed in a very nice, beautiful shape. Very geometric and, and asymmetric, uh, symmetric. Very beautiful. It's incredible how sensitive water is, and that, that is a reflection of what you are. Um, there are several quotes also that could be directed from me. Um, the first thing that he is saying here. <coughs> Uh, is about wishing and materializing your wishes, trying yeah, to, to, to realize your dreams in life. This is what he says about that. What you really know is possible in your heart is possible. We make it possible by our will. What we imagine in our minds becomes our world. That's just one of the many things I have learned from water. Do you understand this a little bit? If you have a wish, you carry a wish in your heart, a dream that you secretly almost keep in your heart, 
and you stay true to that dream, to that wish, <coughs> will manifest. Because, well, I, I have done this in practice with coming to Korea and building my yoga school. That was a deep, a dream to, to realize, and it realized, to my astonishment actually, you understand a little bit what it is to have a dream, to carry a dream in your heart? If you think about it, mentally, if you rationalize it, you just don't believe it. You start to doubt about yourself, you think it will never happen anyway, but in silence, on intuitive level, you keep believing in it, whether you like it or not, that, that is very powerful. If you have a real dream to fulfill in your life, <coughs> If you rationalize it, you never believe it, but you keep that dream in your heart anyway. One thing important to do as a human being is to not ignore that dream. Because many people end up being always very mental, rational, and so they will constantly dismiss the dream and continue to focus on what is expected from them in this society. As a result, you grow old and you regret never having spent any time to fulfilling your dream. But if you are sensitive, and often with yoga this sensitivity increases and, and the dream becomes uh, so strong that you cannot ignore it, and you have a little bit of courage, because this is very important that you have courage, you will little by little do things, consciously but most of the time subconsciously, you will do things that slowly but certainly lead to materializing your dream. And although you don't know it, one day all the pieces of the puzzle come together, all the dots are being connected, and suddenly things start taking off. That is the path of the spiritual person. And ironically, that is a very tumultuous path, full of obstacles. Because in order to be ready to fulfill your dream, you have to reach a high level of standard of spirituality. Because the dream is in the heart. The dream is in the heart and goes beyond what you mentally construct, your ideas about life that you mentally construct, and that your parents and teachers have taught you. And when it comes to the heart, the heart is your center of higher emotions and desires, of hope, of love, of compassion, empathy, making your wishes come true also, lies in the heart and when you give yourself onto that path of pursuing your dream <coughs> living your dream you inevitably will come across many conflicts too. first of all First of all, most of the times when you pursue your dream, it goes against what is expected from you, by, especially by parents, other family members, but also the pressure from society that you should pursue a career, that you should pursue education in a certain direction, that you should behave according to certain uh, expectations, limit, uh, uh, certain unwritten rules. And the characteristic of a person who pursues his dream is that he goes against the odds. He goes against all that is expected. That causes a lot of conflict because people will give you the impression that you're crazy for what you're doing. 
but you will have conflict yourself also because you see people pursuing their careers. You see them being stable, start a family, buy a nice house, and they become financially comfortable. While you are pursuing your dream, you don't have all of that. And you start, many times you start to doubt about yourself, what the hell am I doing? Because you start to rationalize. And you see people becoming more and more comfortable, and you ask yourself, when am I going to be comfortable? But you know what? Comfort is tamas. It is killing people. It is killing people's creativity. It is killing people's spirituality. It is killing people's dreams. Your vital energies die as a result of that. So comfort is nice for a human being when you think about it rationally. But every time you end up in a situation, I have noticed as a yogi, every time when I think I have reached a certain goal, and I think, finally, uh, deep side, finally I can uh, relax now, I become very itchy and restless and, and, or depressed even. And it made me realize that it never stops. Whatever you achieve and reach as a goal, when that is realized, you're not done. You are ready for the next level. It's as simple as that, and it never stops. You have to realize that. And comfort, you can achieve in another way, by not having to worry anymore about your daily uh, existence. But comfort in a professional way, with what you are pursuing in life, doesn't work. That leads to deterioration, and you break down what you have built up before. Do you understand this a little bit? So in the end, of course, the answer is that there has to be a compromise, or a middle way, to be found, a balance, indeed between having relative stability and by always having that challenge before you of fulfilling your dream and building it out further after you think you have fulfilled it. Because there is no end to it. So to fulfill your dream you have to be courageous, to say the least. Because it requires a lot of, you will be full of doubt many times, you will be full of temptation to turn away from that path that you are following in your heart. And I have told you about this guy in Holland who is now in his early 50s and he did give up. He's just ready to die. You remember? So, you have to be courageous and you have to, uh, you have to stick to your, to your dream, even, and especially when it becomes difficult. They are not afraid to die. 
They stand by their principles. They'd rather die than feeling dirty as a result of giving in to fear. They do not panic under difficult circumstances. They always stay in control. They keep oversight. And they rather die. So spirituality, real spirituality, equals courage. Because real spirituality cannot develop without courage. It's as simple as that. You understand this? Spirituality means that you go on a trip inside yourself. You are constantly looking in the mirror. And that means that you see many things that you don't like. You come across many things that you don't like about yourself. And that in itself requires a lot of courage, because if you don't have courage, you just stop doing that, you just ignore it, and you start focusing on your things on the surface, things that are not related to you. So it's inherently correct, connected uh, with each other. Good. Heart chakra, which we have already arrived at in this way. <coughs> I hope you have read the fire a little bit. start to develop sympathy and more 
over, you start to develop empathy. You develop the ability to feel another person's feelings and understand them. That is when you become, when you start developing sympathy towards other people and start becoming nice and you, you become concerned about uh, people who are in bad circumstances. You, you become concerned about animals, treatment of animals or animals that are being driven to extinction. You start to open your heart. As a yogi, you push this to a much higher and deeper level. And as a, in general, if you practice yoga regularly, your heart should open up after between 6 and 12 months, if you practice regularly. You constantly raise your energy as a result of concentration in Ashna Chakra, there comes a point that you break through the glass ceiling of the diaphragm and your heart opens up. You become compassionate. When you look at the drawings of Anahata Chakra, one of the things that you will see is that Shiva and Shakti cross to get cross each other in the heart chakra. That is, of course, uh, graphical. That is, in reality, <coughs> not absolutely like like that, exactly like that. But there is a daf, David cross, cross of David, <coughs> which are two triangles in opposite directions. That's indicating the Shiva and Shakti flows crossing at that level. But another symbol in the heart chakra is the deer. And we know the deer is a super sensitive animal, very skittish, hiding in the bushes, and when it feels the slightest presence of a human being, it will turn its head and look and run away. That is indication of alertness. So the deer in the heart chakra stands for alertness, which means that you have to deal with your with your feelings in the heart chakra very sensibly. Why is this important? Because compassion, empathy can turn against you. And you see this very often when people start to develop these kind of qualities, which is good, but they have no measure, they have no control. And we become engulfed in compassion and empathy for the weaker people in society, for animals, for nature. And we become very emotional as a result of that. We become very emotionally involved with those kind of issues. And as a result, we, <coughs> harm, we harm ourselves. To deal with this in a sensible way, we have to learn to understand that we cannot carry the burden of the whole world on our shoulders. The Greeks had a god or a deity by the name of Atlas. Do you know Atlas? Atlas is the man who carries the whole world on his shoulders like this. You cannot. You will break your spine carrying, trying to carry the whole world on your shoulders. So how do you deal with this then? This is important. And this is where the deer comes in. You have to pay very close attention to what is happening inside you as a result of your compassion, as a result of your empathy, and you have to learn to keep distance. It is as simple as that. That does not mean that you should oppress your compassion and your empathy, but you have to use it in a constructive way. Do not allow it to destroy you. Because when it destroys you, you are of no use anymore. 
So you have to learn to take professional distance, as it is called. Not cold, but to protect yourself. This is something that doctors learn when they are in medical school. <coughs> Unfortunately, they don't understand exactly how it works, so they become very cold to patients. They have to, because they deal with people who are brought into the emergency room, they are dealing with people who are terribly sick, have had very serious operations, people who are um, terminally ill, people who are going to die, etc. If you are a doctor, or a nurse, or whatever, in medical profession, and in essence, you become a doctor, or a nurse, or a medical professional, as a result of your care for people, not because of uh, the TV series ER, or other glamorous uh, stories about the medical profession. If you go home, you should be able to leave all that misery behind you, and this is very difficult. So you learn in medical school that you have to take distance from that. But the problem I have noticed many times when I go to a hospital is that they become very cold. They have no compassionate way to take distance. They just become, they treat you like a machine. They are acting like a robot. And there are only few doctors and nurses with whom you can feel that they have understood how to keep professional distance while not losing their compassion. So we're talking about that kind of distance. You have to, when you see people who are in misery, you have to rationally understand that you cannot solve their problem. And even more importantly, you becoming very emotional as a result of their misery is not of any help at all to those people. So if you want to be of any help, you have to keep distance and just try to do what you can. But not more than that. But this is very important in protecting yourself. That is why the deer is a symbol for the heart. You have to be very alert of what your compassion, empathy is doing to you. And with your meditation, you will develop the ability to create that professional distance. But without becoming cold, like some people do when they don't understand this principle. So for people in the medical profession, this is very important because they too can destroy themselves if they care so much about all those patients that they see passing by. But they should maintain that care while developing the ability to stay at a distance from it. You have to understand, and this is maybe another story, but you have to understand that people who are in misery, people who are in trouble in their lives, whether that is medical or not, one way or another, there is a reason for that. And directly related to that, you have to understand at the same time that when people are in misery, there is a reason for that, they have to learn a lesson from it. And if you solve their problem from them, for them, out of compassion, because you feel deeply for them and you feel sorry, so you help them to solve their problem, they do not learn their lesson, next time they will be in trouble again. If you understand this, it will also be a little bit easier to keep that distance, to detach yourself from other people's misery. Do you understand this? <coughs> Do you? Yes. It's very, this is very important to understand in your life. I'm trying to make different connections for, on an interpersonal level, I understand it. If, someone, if someone's, uh, if someone's got a smaller problem, but in larger circumstances, I can't wrap my head around it. Okay, I will give you an example. Um, 
My previous wife comes from a family of five, three guys and two girls. And she, my wife was the oldest of the family. And they, they had a sister who was deaf mute. She, she not was, she still is. In Korea, people who are handicapped are very much helped by their family to the point that they don't develop any responsibility, they don't develop any independence, because the family is always helping them. That is a filial pity. You have to. That is a duty. And you cannot ignore that because other people will tell you how bad you are if you do ignore it. But I coming here, stubborn Dutch guy, and not only stubborn Dutch guy, but also a yogi. I see what is happening, and this whole family basically is always running behind her to clean up the mess. She was married with a guy who's also deaf mute. They had two, two children who were healthy, and they never did a thing. They were depending on handouts from the family, and sometimes they had a job for a week or two, and then they will quit again because they were not satisfied about something. There was no responsibility, there was no consistency, nothing, no stability. And so every three months, gas, electricity, internet, TV connection, everything would be cancelled because they didn't pay the bills. And they would be standing in front of the door with a whole uh, fan of bills. Honey, please help. And so the whole family would chip in again, putting together a couple of hundred uh, thousands of won, or sometimes millions of won. All the bills would be paid. And the same thing would happen again three months later. And whenever they earned some money, they would order pizza, chicken, uh, rent uh, movies, they would buy a new car, second hand of course, and especially they needed to have a big one because big cars have status. They're absolutely ridiculous, and I see that happening. And so I started explaining to my wife that if you continue to do like this, it will never stop. And we talked about this many times. Uh, and at a certain point, my wife indeed started uh, to, to, uh, to actually stop helping. And the rest of the family also stopped helping. But of course, I was the devil. But they stopped helping. They stopped paying the rent. They stopped, and they divorced as a result of that. So big misery in the beginning, which you can see as a purification process. Um, they moved to another house, smaller, without air conditioner, and slowly but certainly this sister started to, to develop her own business. She is somewhere in Ujjambu, selling in a street stall, selling uh, uh, all kinds of uh, souvenirs and, and uh, uh, you know, all these pretty things uh, you can buy for children and, and hair clips and all these kind of things. A whole street stall. This woman started taking care of herself. She started having an income. She has her own house now. She has her own, her own car. Nobody pays bills anymore, but most importantly, she has developed responsibility. The girls are doing very well in school now. In the past, they were just street girls, going nowhere in life. She has self-respect, dignity. And it took a couple of years to get to this point. During all those years, I was the devil. <laughs> but it shows that if you continue to help people solving their misery, they will never climb the ladder towards a better life. You deny them the possibility to grow. That is the point. And you do that out of compassion, but if you understand this, your compassion should tell you not to help. And this goes against everything you feel, of course. That's why you have to be strong. But you will see that in the end, it pays back not double, but hundred times. So, as an example of how it works when you help people who are in misery, which is 
deny, you simply deny them. You also deny them self-respect and dignity. Those people had no self-respect and dignity, constantly begging to be helped. It was convenient to do like that. It was comfortable to do like that. Family will take care of everything when, when trouble arises. And that doesn't happen anymore. And the, the dead mute woman, um, she changed totally. She became a real person and she, she starts feeling important. And that is, you know, you can't express this in money or in material things. That is, that is so incredibly valuable. And it, it radiates off to the girls who are doing very well in school now. Well, before they would be outside uh, with the other school kids smoking and, and doing all kinds of bad stuff. They don't even remember anymore how they lived a couple of years ago. They're model, model girls. <coughs> so absolutely incredible. That is the result of, of, of this point I'm trying to make about, about being compassionate. But you have to know, you have to have the alertness of the deer to understand what the consequences of your action will be. And this means that sometimes you have to decide, in spite of your compassion, your empathy, you have to decide to keep distance. When people are in misery, they have to fight to solve that misery so that they can learn valuable lessons in life. Is it, sorry, is it still a hard choice for you to make that decision? make that call? Or do you feel... Yes, you know, I'm a very sensitive guy and I have been on this path for decades and for me, intuition always prevails. And surely I feel... <coughs> I've had many doubts about what I did in this situation. Doubt comes from the mind. So intuitively I knew I was wrong. But I had to swallow a lot of uh, bullshit for this. <laughs> they hated me. Everybody, including my wife. It's just such a big issue, whether it's parents being too... Uh, spoiling their children or being... Same. Or when it goes into the sort of welfare, uh, social justice issues. That's the same. Libya. Look, <laughs> like, yeah, that's the same. Look at the situation in Holland. Holland is a welfare state. And uh, after the Second World War, the welfare state took off very well. Uh, in the first 10-15 uh, years, uh, the people who really needed it would, would appeal to the government to be supported. But it ended up with uh, many people coming to the country and also many people in the country uh, just not wanting to work because it's so convenient the government gives you money. And that, that situation has existed for uh, 40 years or so, is not tenable anymore, and now they have to become very strict, and they have to force people, pe there are people in their 20s, 30s, 40s who are totally healthy, they just like to sleep until 12 o'clock, and they drive cars, and they have the newest TVs, and etc., but they don't do anything in society, and that's not what, that's not what the welfare state was built for, it was built for people who are incapable to work, so people who have worked for 50 years in their lives, and then Retire. That's what it was for. This <coughs> abuse has, has been incredible, not only in Poland, but many European countries and other welfare states. Um, as long as you keep helping those people, they will not feel inclined to work. Take away their monthly allowance, which is pretty good in Holland, minimum salary, minimum wage. Take away their money and they are forced, they are forced to work. So, because it is a, 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 it is a democratic state with, with human rights, etc., it's not even possible to take away the monthly allowance. But they put pressure on people in another way. If you don't, they are being invited to come to the office and told that if you don't do effort to find a job, we will give you a job. And if you don't accept it, we will cut your allowance by 30% or so. And slowly but certainly, they, they uh, increase the pressure. They will never let you without money, but they do. After so many years of abuse, they do uh, now put pressure on people to work. People who can. If you look at the situation in Korea where the welfare state is only just beginning, the many people working here who would never work 
in European countries. All people, people with their backs up to be bent, with their bodies just worn out of 50, 60 years of hard labor, they're still working. You had a question, Thomas? I saw you putting up your hand a couple of times. Um, so, well, I was just going to comment that, uh, yeah, uh, professional bankers, you see them in the subway, you see sometimes these guys, they're, they're sitting on a, this cart, yeah. they've got their legs wrapped with a tarp, yeah. that if you help them, you just uh, enable them to never do anything with their lives until they develop. They're just uh, a leech, basically. Yeah. <coughs> so it's kind of difficult to point to say no. That, so, yeah, that is true. That is, uh, that is a conflict that you will always have to do with. You just do what you think is best, and then later you will uh, draw a conclusion. In Holland, there are people who have tested. They, they have, uh, just for, uh, for to write an article in a magazine or so, or a newspaper, uh, journalists or, or other uh, people, they have just become a beggar for a month or so, and their income is back then. They earn hundreds of euros a day by begging in the street. Much, much more than people who work at a normal, regular job. But of course, there are also people in the streets, like the guy on the cart uh, with his legs wrapped in the car or uh, rubber tires in a tube of a uh, tire. What can they do? So you, you, you have to make for yourself the distinction between you know, people who can walk and, and have their faculties, they, they, they can work as well. People, <coughs> yeah, anyway, this, this is also something you have to figure out yourself. When is it warranted to help and when should you not? You have to figure that out yourself and you do that by trial and error. Um, if, if it hadn't worked out with my wife's sister, uh, I would have had to carry a very large burden on my shoulders for messing up something very badly. But I followed my heart and of course I'm happy that it worked out well, but it has led to a couple of years of uh, great tension and um, doubt whether I was doing the right thing. But that is the alertness of the deer that you need to have. Uh, deal with your feelings in a very sensible way. Do not ignore them, but do not allow them to destroy you either. And the third element is that you have to understand why people are in misery. And sometimes or often there are situations, you know, people really can't do anything about it, like a situation of war or incredible poverty in certain regions, droughts disasters that are happening, that is something totally different. There are many situations, if people are, uh, when people are in misery, it is only because of their own doing. Because they fail to do something that they should do, to take care of themselves, to take care of their own situation. But this is complex, you have to always weigh the, the information that you have and, and follow your feelings. There is, there is a very dynamic process going on. 
uh, of evolution. Yes, sir. I like standing over the guy with his legs in rubber and saying, karma's a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> no, of course not. Then you are violating several of the yamas. You can never do that. Never. So for people that born in North Korea, or you think that they, they deserve that, that fate? No, you can't say, no, 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 you can't say that. When you look at wars, there is, there is national karma at work there. The, the, there have been conflicts over, uh, over the ages and over the millennia. And when you are in a, in a, in a country that is in war, and you die, or you get wounded, or your family members die, uh, that is not your personal karma. That is something that rises far above your personal karma. That is, that is the, the conflicts of the past lead to the conflict that you are in now. And you are, well, you can say you are at the wrong time, at the wrong place. Uh, uh, but there is a higher power who decides where you will be born. And the misery that you are being put in is there to teach you something. The people who are born, if you look at what happened after the Second World War, a huge humanitarian development has taken place uh, in, in, in respect to uh, human rights, in respect to compassion also for people who have less than, than others, um, in respect to everything that is, that is not, not just, that is not right. Slavery has been abolished in, in, in parts of the world where it still existed. Um, <coughs> native, popula <coughs> native populations that, uh, <coughs> that have been oppressed until even recently and um, have basically, to a certain extent, gotten back their rights and apologies. Uh, that there is still a long way to go in that respect, but anyway, it is taking place all based upon compassion, empathy, and also putting straight the, the, the mistakes from the past, the wrong ones from the past. Um, those situations, situations of war, situations of turmoil, um, that, that leads people to more development spiritually. So, looking at it from that point of view, you see that there is, there is always uh, uh, evolution <coughs> taking place. And Alice Bailey also names uh, the World War. She calls the First and Second World War one conflict. And she calls the World War a big purification process, and you can see that, that has taken place. The Korea War was a remnant of that conflict. And the things that happened after that, <coughs> you can't do. And there, of course, you can, there, there are many things you can say about that, right or wrong, it doesn't matter, it's just happening. And it's all coming forth out of previous uh, uh, conflict. And very interestingly, very interestingly, what you see now with the conflict in Libya is that America is, take, is keeping its hands off. Let me, see, let me notice this. They would always stand up and be the first in line to do something. And as a result, Europe became very complacent. They let America do all the difficult work. Now America has said, if, if you don't do it, I won't do anything either. And now European countries are stepping up to the plate. It's very interesting to see how the, all this develops. Because <coughs> surely America has been uh, past 10 years or so, uh, there has been a huge uh, hatred towards uh, uh, America. Because America always does step up to the plate. And surely they have made mistakes. But in my opinion, what I see happening is that the whole process of, of democratization after the Second World War, that is continuing. And America is one of the biggest spreaders of development in forms of education and medical health care and, and uh, emancipation also. Uh, it's one of the biggest spreaders in the world doing that. And Europe is always in the back seat and basically now forced to come forward and do their part. Um, it's 
So that then is a process that is taking place, and uh, uh, I find it. I, I, I'm very happy to see that the past three, four years, uh, very uh, uh, young, young new leaders have uh, taken power in those countries, Russia included. Young leaders have taken power who are very sensible and down to earth. Uh, I don't know if you have felt this too yourself or if you have seen this, but there is just an enormous enlightenment movement going on in the world. And the young leaders of, of, of those countries are unifying and, and joining their strengths. And in the end, the whole world will become like that. Look at what is happening in the Middle East now. That is all a result of that. It takes only decades, sometimes hundreds of years, before those those processes work out. And, and do not forget that uh, we are dealing with huge amounts of people, huge amounts of interests, and there are always some things that go wrong. But focus on the positive thing that is happening and do not... There are all those conspiracy ideas, all those conspiracy theories, that the motivations are not pure and I don't know what. Sometimes that is true. When you work, in Holland we say when you chop wood, there will be wood chips. You understand? You can't do anything without causing a little bit of damage here and there. So I prefer to look at, at uh, what I see is a very positive movement going on. And it's a very rapid development. It's happening very fast. About the heart, very important issue that I have to mention about the heart is the issue of unconditional love. Because unconditional love is something that many people find very difficult to practice. How do you know whether you are capable of unconditional love or not? Just look at how you react to your partner or your child, if you have a child. Look at how many expectations you have and how you feel, become emotional when those expectations are not met. Look at how disturbed you are when your partner or your child Let's keep it to a partner. When your partner looks at somebody else, look at how disturbed you are when you know that your partner is in a place with other people and is supposed to meet you at 7 o'clock and 7 o'clock passes and your partner is still not there. Many people become very angry and rage. Where were you? You were supposed to be here. Why didn't you give me a call and, and, and I was just waiting here for you? And that, is, that is expectation. That is conditional love. The jealousy, the incredible attachment that we have is very difficult to deal with for almost everybody. And that's understandable, but, you know, if you listen to certain pop songs, there is a lot of wisdom embedded in those pop songs. Artists, real artists in general, are very sensitive beings, and they understand love. They understand <coughs> unconditional love. And so Sting, son, in his song, if you love someone, set him free. And this ju just sounds like a, a, a lyric, a nice, interesting pop song or something. But this just one sentence has such a deep meaning. If you love someone, set him free. Because if you don't set your lover free, you kill the love. Do you understand this? No, you don't understand this. 
Look, people who meet each other, fall in love with each other, the first couple of days or maybe weeks or maybe even months, you walk on clouds. You are so in love and your heart opens up and, and so beautiful, you look at life through pink glasses. But very soon, very soon, you fall down very hard and heaven becomes hell. <laughs> Absolutely true. Why? Because you become attached to each other and you start putting conditions on your relationship. Yeah, you do like this and I don't like that and why, do you, why are you wearing this strange uh, skirt or, or trousers or your hair is a little bit strange, why don't you go have a haircut? Where were you last night? I was supposed to, you, you didn't call me. All kinds of conditions come into play and friction occurs and you start to hate each other. In relationships where people become very attached, even though you hate each other, you stay with each other because you can't bear the thought of being alone. But your love simply just turns into tolerating each other. There's no passion anymore. There's no love anymore. You just depend on each other, keeping each other alive. Thomas? Do you think very young people can, you know, teenagers can really be in love with one another? Or is it like uh, a crush or puppy love? <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I knew this Christian pastor, he said, just thought it was impossible for teenagers or young 20-somethings to ever really be in love, at least for the beginning stages of the relationship. You just thought it was just... I don't agree with that pastor. Really? My memories of elementary school and, and, uh, and uh, uh, grammar school are incredible when it comes to love, being in love, which you usually do in silence. Right? Um, that is, of course, something totally different from a mature law. But, but I mean, is it really love? I mean, it's more like a... I don't know. That's the word. A crutch. <coughs> what is love? Hormones. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sexual feelings. Yeah, yeah, of course. But love includes sexual feelings most of the times. Not always, but when it comes to... to people loving me, falling in love with each other. Uh, I, 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 I think uh, at a very young age you can feel that kind of love. But of course it's very immature. But it's, it's so fickle though. Yeah, of course. I mean, it's because, like, because you are not developed yet. As you know, after, after two weeks they love somebody else. And, Wait, you just said you love me. What, what's what? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> we, we no, but no, but I, I experienced that in a different way. When I fell in love uh, in elementary school, I would be in love with that girl for years, but in silence. But but my heart would be pounding in my chest, and uh, after school, I would uh, take my bicycle and ride through her neighborhood, hoping to get a glance of her and and, and <laughs> feel like a, you know. <laughs> but that is. When you get older, you lose it, maybe, but... Maybe I'm just bitter. <laughs> <laughs> Why? I don't know. I'm not successful. But to, to be in love, you have to open yourself up and make yourself vulnerable. And I, I have... I, have, I haven't had uh, many relationships in my life, uh, maybe uh, four or five or so, or six. Um, <laughs> but but I've always, in, in, the, in the first couple of relationships, I've been very, very deeply hurt. Because I'm, I'm so sensitive and I'm so spontaneous and open, I've been very, very deeply hurt. Um, but suffering in silence also, I would never fight or... or or scream or I would just suffer in silence. Um, but from those experiences I have learned unconditional love. If, uh, if my girlfriend wants to kiss somebody else, I don't get upset. Uh, then I will just say, oh, if that is what you want to do, then you just do it. It just tells me something, but I, 
I have had the experience that I would be terribly upset, totally torn apart, and that is just not worth it anymore. If that is what you want to do, then, then just do what you want to do. But, you know, it means something has broken there already, and I accept that from the moment that I'm never going to be upset about that anymore. Don't you feel? The, the, then the question becomes, on what conditions do I give someone unconditional love? Oh, come on. <laughs> No, really. Who no, do you give unconditional, unconditional no. love to? No, you, don't no. give, you don't give unconditional love to anyone. So who do you, how do you decide <coughs> unconditional love? Unconditional love means that if your partner says today to you, Jeffrey, Michelle comes to you, you know, you have been together for I don't know how long, but say you have been together for a couple of years, you have plans for the future even, and Michelle comes to you today and she says, my God, Jeffrey, you know, I've been walking around with this issue for, for actually since even before I knew you. But I really feel I have to explore something, you know. Um, I just, I want to go to Australia. And I have to do this. I, I really feel I have to do this. It is something that, that has been playing around in my mind and I just, it, it, it is becoming an obsession and it's frustrating me that I can't fulfill it and, you know, I love you dearly, but I have to go. What do you do when you're an extrovert? You, you forbid her to go. You say, no, I can't live without you. You have to stay with me. I love you. <laughs> if you really love her, then you say, Michelle, you know what? I understand. This is necessary for your growth. And because I love you, I will let you go. And whatever the future will bring, I will accept it. If you come back to me, I will be very happy. If you don't, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with it. I'm that, with you there. I, I, can't, I, I can't give everybody unconditional love. <laughs> That's because you're a man. <laughs> no, it's true. Women, women by nature understand unconditional love much more because since the beginning of our existence, they have been taking care of children. And taking care of children is a huge sacrifice. Moms make without question, without asking anything in return. And for men, men are, you know, there is some simply a division. Women are more working with the heart. Men are more working with the head, taking care of the family in a material way. Women take care of the family in a way of the heart. Men take care of the family in a way of the head, making money. Providing a house, stability. There's a little bit of black and white in the picture, but then this is the reality, and, and that is very deep in our genes. That's just that is the reality. And in, in, in that sense, you see also that women have much less problem with meditating. Because meditation is, is a matter of, of surrender. And because women work with the heart, that is, for most women, that's easier than for men. But the whole process begins with conditions like you meet someone and they meet these dreams inside you and then and I just I've been struggling with this for years too. It's just yeah, but listen, Jeffy, if you start to philosophize about unconditional love, you can say that unconditional love in itself is also a condition. But this is not important. The concept of unconditional love is important that you understand when you are in a relationship, if you put conditions on your relationship, you open up a can of worms that has no end. Because <coughs> one conflict causes another conflict, bad feelings start to arise in both, and usually there's just a spiral, negative spiral going down, which ends up in, if people stay together, they just, they just want to be comfortable and grow fat and, and uh, if if if, uh, if you have courage, then you step out of such a relationship. But this is all very complicated. There are many things that complicate such kind of issues. But but um, you know, two years ago we had a, a basic course here. I've mentioned this uh, person already. I think uh, Tamara Tamara Kowalska. Um, she's married to a guy. Uh, um, who played in a band. He had many concerts also here in Seoul. Um, 
He looks very rough in a way, but he's studying theology. So this guy actually is very balanced. He's like a yogi, but in, a, in another way, in his own way. Uh, they went back to Vancouver, where she started teaching yoga, and she's also she's encountering all kinds of obstacles and difficulties that many people just uh, would not be willing to take. She's doing that. I'm very proud of her. Um, she wrote me an email one day, and she said she gave a very good example of not unconditional love. She said. <coughs> I'm so frustrated and, and things are not, everything costs so much effort and it doesn't seem to, to work out and I'm working like six days a week in a coffee shop and on top of that I have several yoga classes and she was full of conflicts and, and she said, I have to, I have to go. And she said, I told my husband, I have to go. She, I, I don't know exactly anymore where she wanted to go, she wanted to leave Vancouver go away from her, from her husband also. And you know, he said, Tamara, I understand. But if you want to go, then please do it. I don't want to keep you back. And that is, that is the people reacting like that in such a situation, that is really rare. Many people are not capable of doing that because the first thing they think of is, oh my God, how about me? Are you going to leave me? Are you going to leave me? How dare you? Ego comes in. And very understandable, of course, but the wise person tries to control that ego and look at the situation from, from the point of view of the person involved. If you have such a strong urge, you have to give room for that person. Can I use this for a moment? We can have the back at 12 o'clock. You, you need to allow the person to have room to develop because the need... Don't be honest. You need to um, <coughs> if you hold back the person out of uh, selfish uh, interest, you hold back the person from pursuing what that person feels deep in the heart. You frustrate that process, and you can be certain that your relationship will sooner or later uh, strand like a ship. It will be reached. Your relationship will sooner or later. It will finish in frustration. So this is, of course, yeah. Try to understand what what the unconditional love means, and ask yourself how you feel that in yourself. This does not mean that you start behaving like a bee and you tell your wife no, or your or your boyfriend or your whatever. You tell your partner and you say, you know, this is what I feel. This is my my destiny. If you start acting like that, then you are not pure simply. But if it's really a deeper calling related to your to your uh, vocation, your dharma, you have to uh, find a way to, to develop that because it is in line with your development. And if your partner keeps you from doing that, sooner or later, you will start hating your partner for that. So, if you love someone, set him free. That is essential. That is essential. If, if I live like that, uh, other people think, how they think about me? That how is, can I control like that? Uh, that is totally unimportant. That is, what you do with your life is nobody else's business. I understand the question. So we come back again to the spiritual person. To be people who are spiritual are courageous. <coughs> when you are courageous, you can take decisions in your life that all other people are against. 
because you are strong enough. If you are married with somebody, then your husband one day says, I, I have to go to Europe. I've been thinking about this since I was a child, but I never paid attention. But these days, I'm even dreaming about it, and it is, it is an obsession. I have something to work out for myself. Of course you will say, no, how can you do that? How, you can't leave me behind. What will my family think? What will my friends say about this? You leave me and I allow you to go to Europe, and I don't even know when you come back. Ridiculous. That is the normal way that people would react. As a result, your husband, after a, after a while, after, so maybe even after a couple of years, he continues to dream about that. It is becoming an obsession more and more. And one day you will find yourself fighting every day. Not about that issue, but about many other things that are actually not important. You start to hate each other. And one day he will walk away anyway, with a lot of fighting and a lot of pain and a lot of misery. Of course you live in a society where it is very important what other people think of you. So you have to be even double as courageous as I as a Westerner. Because I don't care. And my family also has had many thoughts about what I'm doing. But they let me go, they never criticize me, and they see that it all works out. They're proud of me, even. But do not let what other people think determine your life. It is, of course, important that you are careful, that you do consider people's feelings, but when it comes to your development, you are the only one that is important. And you do that, you you always try to be careful, you always try to keep harmony, but in the end, your interest comes first. And if they don't understand, they will understand later. Maybe many years later, but they will understand later. The same way my wife's family understood after many years um, that my idea about how to treat their sister was correct, and actually worked out incredibly well, miraculously well. In the same way, my friends and family uh, understood after many years that pursuing my dharma, pursuing my dream, worked out very well. In the same way, your family will also understand later why you made the decisions that you made today. If you try to explain it, they will not agree. But you have to stand firm, you have to put your foot down. Your life is not their life. They are, your family is not going to make you happy. They are not going to help you to fulfill your dharma in your life, your destiny. You have to take care of that yourself. You have to do that. If you consider only your family, you will never do for yourself what you have to do what's in your heart, so you will live all your life in frustration. Because that consideration for your family, you don't get anything in return for that. They will not make you happy. You, you are the only one who can make yourself happy. You are the only one who is responsible for that. That is one very important lesson that I have learned. Nobody can make you happy. You have to do that yourself. Yeah, you like that? Um, I, well, if you, <coughs> if you feel unconditional love for someone and you follow this train of thought, like setting them free, yeah. but it's <coughs> not returned, isn't, aren't you taking a really big risk of becoming a doormat? Yes, of course. And that is why you have to be very careful and alert. Don't become a doormat. So you have to make sure that they deserve your unconditional love. I think when you transform the way you are transforming now as a result of the yoga practice and you're, you're looking at life from a very different perspective than you have, you will also change your... Um,
the, the kind of people that you feel attracted to will change. Because you are much more sensitive, you will start becoming attracted to people who are equally sensitive. So the kind of people you met before have no attraction to, any, to you anymore. You will start feeling attracted to people who are at that level that you are on now, at this moment, which is different from a couple of years ago or so. Um, you could simply not communicate anymore with people uh, 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 on that lower level. Because they just, meet, they, they just miss the nuance that you have now. So, you know, relationships are very dynamic and, and, and um, we all make mistakes. We have to make mistakes because we learn so much from it. And never become a dog. <coughs> if you have a feeling that that is happening in, in, a, in a relationship, then let that be a lesson for the future. But do, not, do not allow your partner to abuse your unconditional love uh, to become a bee that flies from one flower to another flower. That has, that has nothing to do with this. <coughs> that, that has nothing to do with this. Then, that, that, in that, if that happens, you just have to let it go. Because there is lack of respect and there is, well, there are many things like in such kind of relationship. Then indeed, you could become treated like a donut and that nobody would want that. So stay alert and if you have a feeling that, that something like that is happening, you just have to enter a relationship. Simple. Otherwise you destroy your self-respect and your dignity. It is difficult to find a partner who also understands unconditional love. That is simply the reality. If you, if you start practicing yoga, my advice, if you have a partner, is come together with your partner. You have to study this together. Otherwise, you will grow apart. Many people don't think that that will happen, but I have seen that happening with students a couple of times. And the transformations that occur, although you may not directly uh, be aware of it, but they are real. So try to practice and study together if, if possible. Okay. Other questions about the heart chakra? Practically, the heart chakra is stimulated by working with the hands. We have done Mahurasana, in which you use the arms very, under very great strain. That's stimulating the heart chakra. Um, in, in the file, I mentioned a couple of exercises we haven't done yet, but Cobra, the Cobra pose, where you make a hollow back. Basically, all exercises where you use your arms. And if you go a little bit through the book of uh, uh, Iyengar, you will see that almost all advanced exercises involve the hands and the arms. So in the beginning you do a lot with your legs, in the end you do a lot with your arms, especially when it comes to strain. Of course the legs are always involved in one way or another, but in the beginning you develop strength in the legs, you stimulate the lower chakras in the body and you gradually go higher and higher. Arm exercises, but of course doing manual labor, that has the same effect. Anything you do with the arm stimulates the heart chakra. Okay. We have to start with the exercises and we start today with Paripurna Navasana. Five minutes